May I begin tonight by saying two things to you that I have said frequently and I do not intend to stop saying them. One is how grateful I am for the opportunity to participate in the preaching and the teaching that is done here at Fairview. I deeply appreciate the invitation from your elders to be a part of the work here at Fairview. You're just a good group of folks and you encourage Brandon and you encourage me even by the way that you listen. And I thank you and commend you for it. The second thing is, let us not forget It's only by the grace of God that we can be here. Only by His grace can we be what we are and do what we do. Let us never glory in our abilities and opportunities without first recognizing where the highest praise belongs. I told you that back some time ago, when I was pre presenting some lessons on what happens to us after we die, <coughs> that I had had a request to present some lessons on angels. And that request was repeated by at least three different people. And I was very grateful to receive the request. and. <clears throat> One of the things that it impressed upon me was the fact that people do have a great interest in angels. It is not only something that interests us, but it is something that is extremely hot in the marketing world right now. And to just give you a little bit of an idea for that, here's just three of recent publications about angels all three of them being on the list of the top-selling Christian type of books. And then you will recognize every time you go into a Christian bookstore that there, there are figurines, there are those that are ornaments for Christmas trees and so on. People wear jewelry indicating their interest in angels. And there are just a lot of things that you find on the market today such as these that tell us about angels or at least propose to tell us about angels. It's a very popular subject. But I want to tell you up front that there are some things about angels that are believed that are not biblically correct. And I will point those things out to you as we go along. <clears throat> we will have four studies, God willing, in this series of lessons on angels. And you will see before I end tonight what those four parts will be, where we're headed in the coming lessons. But there seemed to be just some groundwork that needed to be laid early on in this study and that's where we're going to begin tonight. The Holy Bible, of course, is our guidebook in all these things. And whatever the Bible teaches is what God teaches. So we want to take a close look at what the Bible teaches about what God has taught us regarding this matter. And here's the very first thing that I find fascinating. There are 108 times in the Old Testament and 186 times in the New Testament that that word angels is found. That within itself tells you that God through the Holy Spirit has given a lot of emphasis to this. It also tells you of the importance of the subject. It also tells you of the importance of those who are angels, of what work they carry out. Now to continue that thought, I found it interesting that while it's not balanced at the first part, the second part is balanced. 
with 39 Old Testament books and 27 New Testament books, they are equal in the times of the occurrence of the word angel in the Old Testament and New Testament books. 17 in the Old, 17 in the New. So that's interesting. It's not greatly significant, but it's interesting. But it tells you particularly that throughout the history of man, angels have been very, very active. And so we turn to something that is imperative, I think, in this kind of a situation. And that is the question that a lot of folks will want to know, they'll, they'll ask it is, okay, who are they? And what is their work? Are they just celestial beings that are up there flying around? Or do they have specific responsibilities? The Bible teaches us that the Hebrew word from which we get the word angels and the Greek word from which we get angels is found in these number of times, which tells you they are doing a lot of activities for God because the meaning of the word angel is a messenger. One who executes God's will. It's that simple. It is a being who carries out the mission of God and in most instances in the scriptures you will find that those angels had this mission to go tell someone a message from God. I will keep on emphasizing <clears throat> that as we go through. <clears throat> For those of you in the back that may not be able to, to uh, discern the writing on the cover of that book, it's Henry Thayer's Greek English lexicon of the uh, New Testament, and that's just simply where he has taken the, English, the Greek words and give them a definition in English words, but true to the Greek language. Ask Brandon about it. Hey, I'm sure he spent a lot of time with Thayer while he was studying in Memphis School of Preaching, and it's, it's recognized that way. I had to make a decision about this, and I want to tell you what the decision is. We're going to look at some examples of angels being referred to in the Old Testament and some examples of angels being referred to in the New Testament. My decision had to be how much time to spend doing so because there are hundreds and hundreds of them. And in each one of those that we have an example of, there is a fascinating aspect of the study of it. And in some cases, it's very spiritually beneficial. But the purpose of this tonight is not to go into a study and application of that. It's simply to impress upon you and me that from the beginning of man until the end of the biblical record, where are the angels? What have they been doing? And so rather than doing a study of the action itself, let's just make some notations along the way. And you may, may find yourself a little bit surprised of how many times they're mentioned and you read it, but it just doesn't occur to you that you've just read it. So here's what I'm talking about. You remember when Lot and his family were endangered in Sodom? God used angels to strike the Sodomites blind, to bring confusion upon them, to hinder them in their evil lasciviousness, and to keep his people safe. Angels were the agents God used in Genesis 19. God gave protection to the Hebrew children 
who were in the fiery furnace as recorded in Daniel 3. He used an angel to protect them. He used angels to give protection to his people time and again. And then you find in the Old Testament in Exodus 14, and this is, has to be one of the most graphic things that is depicted for us in the scriptures of how God used angels to go before the Israelites when they were released from Egyptian bondage by Pharaoh, although reluctantly, but they were on their way to the promised land. And as they got to the Red Sea, and as they proceeded on their journey, you remember there was a pillar of fire, there was a pillar of smoke. God protected his people, and he used the angels to go before the Israelites' camp and provide for them safe passage. That's found there in Exodus 14. And then on one occasion, from Dan to Beersheba, Beersheba, I meant to say, from Dan to Beersheba, as recorded in 2 Samuel 24, there was one occasion when in just a sequence of a short time passing, God used angels to execute 70,000 people working against his people. God has used angels as agents in that regard. But what about in the New Testament? Well, first of all, we start out by noting that it was an angel that first came to a man by the name of Joseph. And then an angel came to the woman to whom he would be married, who would conceive by the power of the Holy Spirit and give birth to Jesus Christ. That announcement came from an angel. And I give it emphasis even as I say it, because you know how excited we get when we hear, oh, so-and-so, and so-and-so -and -so are going to have a baby. And it is an exciting moment. It's, it's, it's just a thrilling occasion. But think about all that was involved. And Mary, <clears throat> the woman who would bear the Son of God, had a cousin. She was pregnant at the same time. And God announced to her, through her husband, Zacharias, about that baby, another baby boy. God used these angels to make world-changing announcements. Then, when that baby was born, as recorded in Luke chapter 2, and the announcement came, the announcement came to those shepherds in the field. Jesus has been born. The Messiah is on the way. He has arrived to bring salvation to all of his people. And out there with the sheep settled in for the night with the shepherds, here was the announcement. Glory to God in the highest. <clears throat> the Bible also tells us a little bit later when that evil king was determined to eliminate any kind of endangerment to his authority, to his power. And God went to Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus. And he said, Joseph, you need to get Mary 
and get Jesus. Prepare for a trip and get out of this place and go down to Egypt and I'll tell you when to come back. He used an angel. Then, after Jesus came back with his family, and the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 4 about Satan tempting Jesus with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It was Jesus. It was God in the flesh. And he had been without a meal for almost six weeks. Being led to the point of temptation, could he separate himself from the desires of this world and carry out what God had in mind. And Satan was also oh smooth. He said, you're hungry. What's laying on the ground in front of you? Just a bunch of rocks. If you'll just say the word, you can turn those rocks into a a wonderful meal. Right now. Just go and do it. And what's one of the things that is a nagging, haunting weakness to a lot of us in our lives of pride, being so full of pride with our out of control self-serving thoughts. And Satan said, go up there to the highest point of the pinnacle of the temple. Cast yourself down. Now, since you're God, you're not even going to have a scratch, let alone a broken bone. Go on and do it. Do you know that story? But right there in the middle of the story as it concludes toward the end is when the Bible tells us God sent an angel to minister to him. To strengthen him. And then of a similar nature, when Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane dreading the execution that he would experience dreading the crucifixion on the cross to the point that he was perspiring sweat as blood and in agony he continues to pray Father, if it's possible, take this from me. But somehow he summoned from within the strength to endure what he came to do. And in my mind, I see an exhaustion emotionally, physically, mentally. And God sent angels to minister to him. He needs, he needs some strength. And then on that Sunday morning after he was crucified on Friday, the women came to that tomb just as the dawn was breaking. The sun is beginning to make its appearance for the day. And they went to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus 
to complete the preparation for his burial. And when they got there, they were told, he's not here. He is risen just as he said he would be risen. Look at announcements to Joseph, to Mary. He, his birth was announced to the world. His resurrection was announced. And in Acts chapter 1, an angel said, when the apostles saw him rise from the earth, to ascend back to heaven, an angel said, why are you standing there gaping? He's coming back in the same way that you've seen him go. Who told him that? An angel. God's heavenly messengers. And God said through the Apostle Paul <clears throat> that the archangel will announce his return when he comes to judge the nations. And all I've given you now is just that smattering, just samples of the amount of times that God used those angels to carry out his holy and divine purposes. And then from that, we move to a consideration that out of all of those angels that have been referred to there, has it ever occurred to you only two of them are given a name that we're identified with? Two. First of all, of course, there was Gabriel, and the second one was Michael. And Michael is the only one designated in the scriptures <laughs> as an archangel. The names of the angels are not the primary factor. It's what they were doing. It's what they were announcing that was important. But someone asked when this request was made, Make sure you talk about the cherubims and the seraphims. It is believed because of what's written about them and this contextual situation that cherubims and the seraphims refer to angels. Now I have put in bracket the letters I am. A cherub, a seraph, is the single, singular form of the word. When you add I am, it puts a plural form on it. And you see, the Bible tells us that cherubims were placed at the gate of the Garden of Eden after Adam and Eve sinned, and God drove them from the garden, and he placed the cherubims at the gate to prevent them from having access to the tree of life. And we're told in Isaiah 6 about Isaiah having a vision in which seraphim were placed above the throne of God on the mercy seat. That Ark of the Covenant Incidentally, was where God met his people. And it was guarded by heavenly beings. In the coming lessons, here's what we're going to study. The next part, <clears throat> as you can I think you could just sort of see we'd have to go to this 
in this sequence, we're going to talk about, okay, so where did they come from? Were they created? How did they come into existence? And how many are there? You may be absolutely stunned when you see what the Bible gives to us about the number of angels. But what about their order and the rank? That's dealt with in the book of Hebrews, and we'll look at a particular scripture there. We will then close our studies with a consideration of six biblical facts about angels in the past, in the present, and in the future. And yes, here's the final word. What about guardian angels? I won't even ask you to raise your hand because I think I know the answer. Most of you have heard people express the idea that they think all oh, little children have a guardian angel. Does the Bible give credibility to that? I've heard a lot of people talk about adults having guardian angels. What does the Bible teach specifically? That's what's ahead of us, God willing. And I also want to make a promise to you, because I've seen a lot of you taking notes tonight. I can get, well, Connie's always good to help me out in this regard. I'm going to give you a, a, a couple of sheets of paper, maybe three, that will have all of the scriptural notations on them and then she can run some copies and make them available to you. Hope that'll be helpful to you. That's our study for tonight. Open your songbooks, please, to the number that has been announced, and we will sing this song now to invite and encourage those who are not Christians to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you're a, if you're a Christian that has drifted away from God, we sing this to encourage you to come back to him because he still loves you and he wants you to be saved. If Brandon or I, or I either one, could assist you, we'll be delighted to. Come, while we